Mrs. Mason taught third grade. And each year, uh, the first day of class, she would have the students draw a picture of whatever they wanted. She said, listen, draw a picture, whatever you want. Her, her thought was that it would be a great way for her to get to know her students on the very first day of class because typically they're going to they're gonna draw a picture of what's most important to them, what's on their mind at that time. And so they all take out paper and some colored pencils and they get to work. And as they're working, she walks around and she's looking at what they're drawing. And of course, she sees you know, families, houses. And she sees some toys, some pets. Some of the kids have just come back from summer vacation, a trip they took with their family. And there's one little boy, he's, he's hunched over. He's kind of hiding his paper, and she stops. She's really curious. Well, what, what is he doing? He's hiding. And she, she says, Jimmy, what, what are you drawing? And he says, God. And she says, Jimmy, no one knows what God's look like, God looks like. And he says, well, they will when I'm done. <laughs> this is the third in our foundation series. We've taken two weeks to look at the Bible because it's what we, the authority and the base of all that we believe. Now we're going to turn specifically to look at the doctrine of God. And I want to begin right here. Is it even possible to know God? And the answer is yes. It's not just possible. Knowing God is the very meaning and the purpose of life. God wants us to know Him. In John chapter 17, verse 3, Jesus said this, This is eternal life, that they may know you the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. That's eternal life, knowing God. 1 John chapter 5, verse 20, we know that the Son of God has come and has given us an understanding that we may know Him who is true. And we are in Him who is true, in His Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. But while we may know God and have a meaningful relationship with Him, because of who and what God is, we can't know God completely. God is infinite. We are finite. And while we can know something of God, we can't know everything of Him. Because a God that we could explain would be too small to worship. I like it to say it this way. While we can apprehend God, we cannot comprehend Him. To apprehend something means to have an awareness of it, but to comprehend something means to completely understand it. So we can apprehend God, but we can't comprehend God. Job chapter 11, verses 7 and 8. Can you search out the deep things of God? Can you find out the limits of the Almighty? They are higher than the heaven. What can you do? Deeper than Sheol, the grave, what can you know? Romans chapter 11, oh, the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has become his counselor? I have. <laughs> Haven't you? God, you should do this. In Psalm 139, verse 6, after David meditates on what God knows, he cries out this, Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. Today and next week, we're going to engage what's called classical theology, which is the doctrine of God himself, studying God. Now, obviously, this is a huge subject. Uh, we could say that this is the biggest subject of all. My goal isn't to just name some of the attributes of God, we want to see what difference His attributes make to our lives practically. And we're going to take a couple of weeks to do that, and even then we will just scratch the surface of real theology. And we'll start with this. There are four ways that God has revealed Himself. Uh, again, for some of you, you might be thinking, man, this is a lot of material. Uh, that's why this is going to be online. We would encourage you, you know, Go back and watch it again. Get out your notebook. You can pause and you can take notes as we go through these scriptures. God has revealed himself in four ways. First of all, what's called general revelation. What God has revealed about himself to everyone through creation. 
In Romans chapter 1, we find this. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness because what may be known of God is manifest in them. For God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. The existence of a creation necessitates a creator. The Apostle Paul says, denying the existence of God when confronted with the reality of the universe is to commit intellectual suicide. Now, we'll dive a little bit deeper into that later added to the general revelation of God that is open to all is special revelation in Scripture. So we return to a verse that we've used over the last two weeks, 2 Timothy chapter 3. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. You see, friends, while creation makes clear the existence of the Creator, it doesn't really tell us much about what He's like. So He tells us about Himself, what He's like. This book, oops, wow, who put that there? (laughs) This book is preeminently about what? It's about God. This is God's book. Third, God has revealed Himself through Jesus Christ. In Hebrews chapter 1, we find this God who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past by the fathers, uh, to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son. God became one of us. He became a human in the person of Jesus Christ. So that in John chapter 14, Jesus could say, He who has seen me has seen the Father. God has also revealed himself by the Holy Spirit. In 1 John 2, we find this. The anointing which you have received from him who abides in you, and you do not need that anyone teach you. But as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things, and is true, and is not a lie, and just as it has taught you, you will abide in him. Now, what is this anointing? Well, it's what Jesus had referred to in John chapter 14. He says, the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send you in my name, he will teach you all things. So God has revealed himself to us through general revelation, through creation, special revelation, through scripture, through Jesus Christ, and then now presently by the Holy Spirit. Question, is God revealing himself to you? Indeed he is. Now, you know, when when it comes to God, we're, we're faced with One of two options, either God is an impersonal force, and we know many people in our world believe that's what God is, right? An impersonal force, or he is in fact a person. Well, scripture is very clear that God is a person. He possesses a mind, emotions, and will. An impersonal force does not have those. Gravity has no emotion. Electricity is mindless. Radiation has no will. But God does have a mind. Romans 11, verse 34. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Who has become his counselor? God has emotion. In Genesis chapter 6. The Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. John 3, 16. Why don't you say it with me? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And then 1 Peter chapter 5, cast all your care upon him. Why? Because he cares for you. God has emotion. That's very comforting to me. That God has emotion. And God also has will. In Revelation chapter 4, we read this. You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will... They exist and were created. Now, I know that we're going over this, again, rapidly, very quickly. 
But now we're going to turn to the, the attributes of God and talk about what he's like. We describe God by his attributes, the aspects of his nature and his character that are essential to who and what he is. You take one of these away and you don't have God. First of all, God is eternal. And, and again, we're going we're gonna to the practical application of this, the difference that it makes in your life in just a moment. But, but hang with me as we look at what the Bible says, that God is eternal. In Isaiah 57, thus says the high and the lofty one who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. Psalm 90, before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. And then Revelation 1, grace to you and peace from him who is and was and is to come. You know, when we say that God is eternal, we mean that he is self-existing. God has no beginning and no end because he stands outside of time. God transcends creation. He exists beyond the border of space, matter, and time. Though he's not in time, God is fully aware of the succession of events that we call time. Imagine this, and again, any illustration that we try to give of God falls short, right? Because we're using human language and human experience, so it kind of helps us apprehend God but not comprehend him. Okay, so God is eternal. And here's maybe a way that we can get into the idea of how God is eternal. And at, though eternal, he's aware of our experience of time. Imagine someone standing on the top of a 20-story building. There's a main street down below, and there's a parade on it. You got that picture? Let's say the Rose Parade. And so here's this person standing on the top of the, of the, the building, looking down. They can see the beginning of the parade and the end of the parade. You and I are on the street. What do we see? Right, what's right in front of us. God is the one who's able to look at the whole span of time. He sees the end. He sees the beginning. And he's aware of where every person is on that street and what's right in front of them. God is eternal. He stands above and beyond time. He's not in time but he's aware of the passage of time. He knows the end from the beginning. He's eternally aware of where you and I are in the flow of time. In affirming God's eternality, we come <laughs> to that, that curiosity of the child and the, the challenge of the critic. How many of you are parents? Raise your hand if you're a parent. Okay. Then you likely experience this. Your child at some point right around the age of five or six, says to you, you're, maybe you're driving somewhere and you point something out, and they go, well, where'd that come from? And you say, well, it was, you know, it came, this person made it. And they go, well, where'd that person come from? <laughs> well, they came from their mom and dad. Well, where'd they come from? Remember this? <laughs> and they eventually get to the point where they, you, you go back far enough and you get to the end and you're annoyed now. <laughs> and you say, shut up. No, and, and you say, right, well, God, God made it. And what's their question then? Where'd God come from? Who made God? The answer is surprisingly simple. By definition, God isn't made. It's implied in the biblical idea that God is eternal and self-existing. To be made or to have had an origin means that there was something before it, Right? And really, that's what we mean by God. He is the one that is before all things and by whom all things arise. God is the one thing that has always been and given rise to all other things. More, God is the necessary one thing that has always been. Amen. You see, friends, logic demands the existence of God. I know that we've covered this not too long ago, but it plays now in our look here at God being eternal. Aristotle, the father of logic, applied his analytical skills and deduced what he called the first cause, the uncaused cause, or the unmoved mover. You see, friends, there can't be an infinite regression of causes. At some point, 
That child's game of who made has to resolve in, a, in an original cause that is itself uncaused. That things are made requires a first maker who by necessity wasn't made. Logic requires something to exist, exist that owns its own existence, a non-contingent something. That's why Romans 1.20 says this, For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Okay, stay with me. If there was ever a moment when there was nothing, what would there be now? Nothing, because nothing is... And what can nothing do? You're all geniuses. <laughs> the materialist contends that it all began with the Big Bang. But that can't be the beginning. Because what banged? Where did that infinitely dense singularity come from? Everything in the physical universe owes its existence to a prior cause. So logic dictates, therefore, that there has to be something that is not physical, not created, but causes everything else. Now consider what God's eternality means for you. God isn't bound by time. God never runs out of time. Do you ever run out of time? God's never in a hurry. He's never rushed. He's never late. Do you need God to do something in your life? Do you feel like he's late? Thanks for being honest, Ty. Please hear me. God is eternal. He sees your end from your beginning, and he knows where you are on the timeline of history. He's not late. If it hasn't happened yet, it's because it can't happen yet. But he sees when it will. He already stands in that place. God is not limited by our scope of time. He's never hurried. He's never rushed. He's never late. He has all the time in the world for you. God is also omnipresent. Omni means all. God is all present. There's nowhere in all creation that God isn't. David was meditating upon this. Psalm 139, so beautiful. He says, you have hedged me behind and before and laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is, it is high. I can't attain it. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you're there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall fall on me, even the night shall be light about me. Indeed, the darkness shall not hide from you, but the night shines as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to you. In Jeremiah chapter 23, God asks, Am I a God near at hand, says the Lord, and not a God afar off? Can anyone hide himself in secret places so I shall not see him, says the Lord? Do I not fill heaven and earth, says the Lord? Can't play hide and seek with God. In Matthew 28, Jesus said, as you well know, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. When we say that God is omnipresent, we mean that He is there, He is present in His fullness. In His fullness, not just a part of Him. God is not more present here than at your house and your workplace. He's not more attentive 
to a pastor or an elder than he is to you. In May of last year, the U.S. Surgeon General declared loneliness an epidemic causing massive damage to our society. The internet and social media have been promoted as ways for people to connect. Do you remember that? Oh, look, it'll be great. People will be able to connect. Well, we know that the exact opposite has happened. People hide behind a virtual wall on X or Instagram, Facebook, TikTok as surrogate selves. They adopt an online persona that's fake and then feel lonely because no one really knows them. Social media is stripping people of the tools for developing genuine intimacy. And the result is a profound sense of loneliness. We've all seen people standing with others around, but all of them on their iPhones. The Bible is clear. God created us for relationship. In Genesis chapter 2, the very first not good thing in God's otherwise all good creation was that Adam was alone and his solution was a companion. It was Eve. In Ephesians 5, marriage is presented as a picture of the relationship that God wants with us. That relationship is possible precisely because God is fully present and intimately engaged everywhere. Is God here? Yes. Is he in your car? Uh Uh-oh. Is he at home? Every room in your home. Is he at work? Is he less at your work than he is here? Do you see what a difference that makes when we really spend some time to meditate on it? God is here. Wherever you are, He's there. And all of His fullness, all of His awareness, all of His readiness, with all the time to be with you in that moment, as fully and completely as He can be and as you can be, Isn't that both comforting and terrifying? Notice how we can have both emotions at play on us at the same time. Oh, that's so precious. Dang. (laughs) He's omnipresent. He's also omnipotent. He's all-powerful. God is called Almighty 57 times in the Bible. In Hebrew, that's El Shaddai. God Almighty. In Genesis 17, when Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abraham and said to him, I am Almighty God, walk before me and be blameless. In the New Testament, God is given the the Greek title Pantocrator, which means all strong. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, I will be a father to you and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Pantocrator, Almighty. It's easy to think of God's power in earthly terms. (laughs) So please don't imagine God as some divine bodybuilder you know, with bulging biceps and a God's gym t-shirt on. You know. <laughs> God's power isn't like that. It's not muscles. It's not economic or political power. God's omnipotence means that nothing can thwart His will. He does what He wills to do, and what He wills, He does. Consider this. God is always all-powerful. You're not. Think of your power. Think of your power before you go to the gym. And then your power afterwards. God is always all-powerful. He never tires. God never tires. He never weakens. When God does something, He has no less capacity to do more. That means creating the universe did not require more effort on God's part than answering your prayer. Because no matter how big a thing God does seems to us, He remains as powerful as ever. God is omnipotent. He can do anything, but not something that is inconsistent with His nature. 
God's attributes are in perfect harmony with each other. So there are some things that God cannot do. Because he is true, he cannot lie. Because he's perfect, he can't change. We need this right now. The body of Christ needs this. Christians need this right now because progressive Christianity would tell us that God has changed. That the God of the Old Testament has changed. He's become enlightened. God is woke. What he said before isn't true anymore because God changed. He, he got hip. He took a pull. And he discovered that the majority of Americans believe this. Oh, God says, oh, well, Michael, change it. God is perfect. Is God perfect? Can he change? Because if you're perfect and, you're cha- and you change, what direction do you have to be moving in? Away from perfection. God is perfect. He does not change. Praise God, He does not change. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God is holy. He can't do evil. Now, here's how God's omnipotence should comfort us and bolster our faith. If you ask me to do something, I'll consider if I have the time and the ability to help. Also, if I want to. If I know you well and what you ask isn't too much of a bother, I'll do it. But if I don't know you well or I deem it's too much effort on my part, I'm going to dodge. Time, effort, and relationship. These are the factors that you and I use to decide whether or not we're going to help someone, assist them. Consider God and our requests that He help us. He's not bound by time. He always has all power, and He knows and loves us infinitely. Do you see how God's attributes make a difference in your life? Do you realize why theology is so important for you? And how what you believe about God is the most important thing about you. Because it changes everything. Apply this to your prayer life. Is it more difficult for God to heal cancer or an ingrown toenail? Which is more difficult? Neither. Now obviously cancer is a greater threat. But when we pray for cancer... Do you know how we're a lot more earnest in our prayer and we pray with greater fervency? We, you, you all know that at the end of our service we have people up here that come up here for prayer. And some people come up with desperate prayers. They've been to the doctor. They've been diagnosed with cancer. And then someone else will come up and, and they, they've been having a problem with headaches lately. And I'll, I promise you, the people that are praying for cancer over here are like, oh God, please, oh God. And the person, Lord, we pray, heal this person of their headaches. As though, as though, we have to talk God into by our fervency doing the the healing of cancer because it's, it's bigger. God has as much power to heal cancer as headaches. And when he has healed, he hasn't lost some of his power. He doesn't have to recover Right praying doesn't aim at changing God's mind or urging Him to do something He's not inclined to. Prayer is how you and I discover God's will and then apply it. This is how Jesus taught us to pray. Your kingdom come. Your will be done where? As it. We do not pray, Lord, may my will be done in heaven as it's done on earth. What a disaster that would be. (laughs) We're going to be taking a look at more attributes next week, but I want to end with this. Prayer is the most important thing that we can do in terms of who and what we are in Christ. Because prayer is the very essence of relationship, and we were created for relationship. But prayer is more than just communion with God. Please hear me. 
I, I, I desire that what, what I'm about to share, you would all leave with, with a new understanding of prayer. Maybe you've never heard this. This has a potential of utterly transforming your understanding of who you are and why God has saved you and what prayer means. God made us in his image and set us on earth to be his agent, his representative to creation. That's why we are created in his image. God could have created us in his image in heaven, but he didn't. He put us where? He put us here to be his representative to creation. He gave us a will to either partner with God or not. Now, we know what Adam did with that ability to choose. He turned from God and he went his own way. In choosing sin, Adam became a slave to sin, an agent to do his bidding. And that is why the Bible calls Satan the God of this age, the prince of the power of the air. God gave dominion to man who forfeited it to Satan. But Jesus has redeemed humanity back to God and restored us to the original plan. Prayer is the way a legal connection is made between heaven and earth. Let me say that again. Prayer is a way that a legal connection is made between heaven and earth so that God's will can come and be done behind enemy lines. God gave humans the right and the ability to determine what would happen on earth. That's why Jesus taught us to pray. What? Your kingdom, your reign, come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Why did he teach us to pray that way unless that's our mission? Prayer is a spiritual beachhead where love, truth, and power of God are able to enter in and affect change. Does God want to work in our world? He's waiting on us to pray that his will would be done, that his work would be done. I love the way one old Bible teacher said it. Heaven is full of prayers that have not yet been prayed or full of answers to prayer that have not yet been prayed. Let's empty heaven of those answered prayers, you guys. You and I are spiritual grappling hooks on the gates of hell. And prayer is the rope that pulls those gates down. God is present. God is all-powerful. He's eternal. Next week, we'll take a look at His omniscience, His holiness, and His sovereignty.